Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the fourth episode of Forgotten Country with me, Zainab Wright. And today I'm joined by Mr. Tariq Bazi, um, who is a recurring guest. And I hope he'll be coming on here a lot more, inshallah. Um, and today our topic is about uh, the educational system uh, and how it jeopardizes our values as Muslim Americans. So before we begin, you know, I want to thank Tarek for being here thank again you. with me today. Um, and we've been facing some interesting times lately in the past few weeks. You know, TMJ has covered a couple events happening in Dearborn mm -hmm. um, that have become a national issue. Um, and a lot of parents around the nation, as well as in neighboring Canada and across the world, they're questioning, you know, the educational system and mm -hmm what their children are being faced with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what, what was your reaction to everything happening in Dearborn? Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, I think, kind of first reaction, I think, alhamdulillah, it's nice that, um, I think that these events kind of served as like a catalyst mm -hmm. to hopefully finally wake people up. Um, it is a little bit unfortunate that it has taken us so long to act. And one of the points that I had mentioned to um, a lot of the brothers and you know some of the community members is the problem is that the nature of these kind of things is that the longer you take to act on your responsibility, the more difficult it becomes. So mm -hmm. you know this is something that you know a lot of us were able to foresee from you know many years ago. Um, this kind of wave that has been you know, coming over the society. And for so long, we had been silent for, you know, a lot of different reasons, um, most of which I think are not uh, really legitimate or valid. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, like we've been silent. And now this wave has kind of picked up so much momentum. So now, yes, alhamdulillah, there's kind of like the straw that the straw that broke the camel's back. And now it's the catalyst and people wake up. But now what we have to kind of resist against is so much more than what we would have been resisting against had we taken our stance earlier. Right. Um, so, and I yeah. think it's it's in interesting to point out that this, you know, a lot of parents at these board meetings that we observed are questioning, you know, why this is even an <clears throat> argument, right? For, for, for there to be meetings and p <laughs> opposition on something that, you know, a lot of parents thought was very straightforward, right? There's these explicit books that are out there on the shelves um, that would be illegal to distribute, right, in a, mm -hmm. a normal setting. Yet they're placed uh, in children's libraries where children, underage children, have access to inappropriate material um, that has nudity, uh, you know, sexual explicit content. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's what we observe the most is I think pure shock. Mm -hmm. um, so you're saying that this is you know a reactionary uh, thing that has long time been coming. Yeah, I mean I think it's not really lost on anybody. Anybody who's <clears throat> excuse me, anybody who's speaking out now. Yeah. I mean you can kind of just kind of go on the ground and uh, gauge it for yourself organically. You know everybody's kind of saying that like okay we're fed up with this. It's been kind of imposed from the top down um, in all kind of facets of society, you know, like every um, every corporation, every state institution, every university, like anywhere you go, they're constantly pushing all of this, um, you know, like sexual orientation, gender uh, identification, gender identity, so on and so forth. Pronouns. Yeah. And, and people binaries. have been so fed up because it's, I mean, it doesn't it, it doesn't really need a very complex argument. I mean, if you look at human history mm -hmm. for thousands and thousands of years, all human societies have kind of had the, the very standard like uh, even even something like gender roles, right? Like right. the roles that men and women have in society for the vast majority of human societies, for all of human history, mm -hmm. it has been pretty, you know, consistent and stable. And even the idea of you know, mixing the genders in in everything um, 
is a relatively new idea that like, you know, essentially came out of, um, you know, like with the enlightenment and with the industrial revolution and, and so on and so forth, um, different political and economic factors, but it, it's a, it's a relatively new thing in, in human history. Um, it's, it's a new thing even today. I mean, we were just visiting up in Canada this past weekend and we were in a restaurant, mm -hmm. um, and the bathrooms have been converted into men and women yeah. bathrooms and it was awkward because i was in there washing my hands and i see men pass by and i'm i'm like what's going on and this is for not just for muslims i there were many right. women who are not muslim looking around they're like what's this yeah, is something and, and odd that's that's kind of the the point about mentioning like the history like the right. human history is that it doesn't it doesn't need like a very complex argument it doesn't need a religious argument mm -hmm. it's it's natural human uh, conscience and natural like innate human nature mm. like tells us that this is is unnatural and if it was natural then it wouldn't need such a heavy imposition from the top down and right. if it was another thing is if it was natural we would have seen it are like thousands and thousands of human years like human uh, years of human history mm -hmm. you could say that you know after a thousand years two thousand years people discover like new technologies or people discover new medicines or whatever but to say that thousands of years of human societies all couldn't figure out that actually there, there are more than two genders, you know, or there's something called non-binary or there's something called gender fluid or like whatever, all right. of this, all of this stuff, like really all of these billions and billions and billions of humans who lived and died, they, they couldn't figure it out. Like mm -hmm. what, I mean, what is that even, you know, like epistemologically, what does that say about human reason and logic, you mm -hmm. know, so... So I, I think that I think, I think that that's why this is this kind of reaction is showing, but it's been boiling beneath the surface for much longer. So I think parents are now asking, you know, what is the bigger agenda? Why are they doing this to our children? Has this always been happening? Like when you and I went to school, mm -hmm. or is this a, a new thing? Um, I mean, you you you've been a teacher in the school systems. Mm -hmm. What is your outlook on? You know, is this a new phenomenon, or it's a long time coming? Yeah, so um, I got, just to clarify, um, so I haven't taught in public schools. I've like right. alhamdulillah, I've been teaching in um, private Islamic schools since I started teaching. Although I've been involved with like a lot of um, different, you know, youth organizations and things like that, where so many of the kids were coming from public schools, and I obviously went to public school here, so um, mm. I'm like, you know, very from direct experience, very familiar with the environment and stuff. Um, mm. I would say that it's it's new in a sense and it's not new in another sense. Mm -hmm. So it's new in the sense of, yeah, obviously, you know, like when when I was in high school, all of like the whole um, LGBT gender um, identity, pronouns, sexual orientation, like all that kind of stuff was not being pushed as mm -hmm. um, as seriously, mm -hmm. although there were kind of like glimmers of it kind of coming to the surface. Um, so it's new in that sense. It's new in the sense that it is being pushed full throttle, mm -hmm. but it's not new in the sense that this is the natural consequence of certain um, customs and practices and ideas that have taken uh, taken hold within society again over the past you know several hundred years and starting specifically you know like with the Enlightenment in Europe, mm -hmm. right? Like when when they took God out of the picture, mm -hmm. right? Then the natural thing like everything naturally will collapse after that mm. you know so that like even even you know non-muslim european nations they had you know pretty strict gender um expectations and they also had um you know expectations of modesty and things like that sometimes like you even see those like old clips um mm. of like places in europe or even america where women are wearing like you know long dresses they're relatively loose and things like that so there's a degree of modesty mm. But when you take God out of the picture, it's only a matter of time mm. before, you know, that modesty and that social barrier breaks down. Mm. And then that would lead to, um, you There's know. There's no end. Yeah. There, so it, so it, it started. That's what I'm saying, that it's it's not new in the sense that it starts with, you know, taking God out. And then it leads to um, like a, a diminishing of modesty within society. Then it leads to um, sexual relations outside of marriage. And then it leads to so many other um sexual deviances and so what we're seeing right now with like 
homosexuality and, and all of these things. Mm -hmm. It's just the natural or the logical next step of the of the scenario. And right. that's why it's even going further now, like pedophilia. And then they're going to get into and the, or they are getting into incest. bestiality, like incest. or incest. And, so it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't end. So mm -hmm. in that sense, it's not new and we should have seen it coming. But there are a lot of you know parents that we also observed saying that, you know, they chose to remove God out of the picture to stop the indoctrination of children mm -hmm. so that, you know, this ideology that's being pushed, the LGBTQ agenda mm -hmm. is also, you know, an ideology. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about that statement? Yeah, I think um, if that kind of realization... Like leveling the playing field, right? Yeah, that if, if that realization is happening, then... Um, I think it would be a really good thing because that's kind of one of the biggest um, hypocrisies and fallacies of secularism as an idea or as a concept in general. Mm -hmm. Like the idea that, okay, if we take God out of the picture, then it makes it neutral and it makes it fair. So no religion is being imposed over any other. Mm -hmm. right? But the, the fundamental point is like, what is a religion in the first place? Mm -hmm. A religion, if you want to like simplify it, because people have, unfortunately, like a superficial understanding. They think like, like Islam is a religion, Christianity is a religion, Judaism is a religion. All right. They think it has to revolve around, you know, some kind of theology or deity or something. Mm -hmm. Religion is a set of beliefs, mm -hmm. a worldview, the way that you understand the world and yourself within it. Mm -hmm. A set of beliefs that translates into a way of life. Right. So if you take it based on this definition, then the question is not whether you have a religion or don't. The question is, what is your religion? Mm -hmm. Because there's nobody who can go through life mm -hmm. without believing things and without acting on those exactly. beliefs, whether you're aware of what you believe in or not. And so the, so everyone's the, practicing some sort everybody of everybody has a religion and there will always be a religion that is being imposed, mm -hmm. whether that's you know, Christianity or post enlightenment, again, like with the secularization of society and mm -hmm. politics and government. Now the like, I mean, ask yourself, if the if the theistic narrative, for example, is that whether you're talking about like Christianity, Islam, Judaism, um, God created the universe. Mm -hmm. Okay, if the school goes, if, if the school comes now, and they have a curriculum that they're going to teach, and they don't mention that God created the universe. Mm -hmm. Okay, you might say, yeah, that's that's fair because now it's not imposing a religion. Mm -hmm. But what do they now say about the origin of the universe? Are they just going to say like, well, we're not going to talk about this topic whatsoever. Or are they going to present an alternate view, which is like they present it in the form of, um, you know, like science. So they say, oh, the Big Bang or whatever. So you took God out of the equation. That's not neutral because mm -hmm. now it's favoring an atheistic right. interpretation of the world. Mm -hmm. And that's like just kind of like at the macro level. But the more you kind of Get dig deeper. deeper and peel back layers, you'll see that everything that God has been taken out of, they have substituted it with some, some other, other kind ideology. of non-theistic but equally religious belief, mm -hmm. right? And so... Um, it would be good for us, uh, especially as Muslims, but I mean, Christians and, and everybody else should realize it, but it would be um, necessary and imperative for us to recognize that and to realize that so that when we so that when we send our kids to public secular schools, we should understand that the school is not only secular, it's mm -hmm. secularizing. So mm -hmm. they're going to they're not only not going to talk about God, but they're going to take God out of your child's worldview mm. and lifestyle. That's so dangerous. I, I feel like, you know, thinking as a child, right? <clears throat> you have, I mean, we grew up with a lot of identity crises and mm. I can't imagine how bad it is now. Right. But you, you have to look at from the perspective of the child who sees something else at school and then goes home and there's a whole other, you know, faith being you know, practiced, mm -hmm. you know, mosque, mm -hmm. what the, the scholar says. Mm -hmm. So what I can only imagine this kind of dichotomy this creates in a child who spends so much of their time in school. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I do believe we're living in some kind of soft war era, right? Mm -hmm. when, where we're really practicing um, 
and falling into the trap of colonization mm -hmm. through through words and ideas and like you said that are being you know taught in in these school systems mm -hmm. can you expand more on you know some of these examples of what children are really exposed to and the dangers of public school systems and why yeah um so just a quick point, like when you say this dichotomy, right? Like kids are, again, and we're speaking from our perspective as like, alhamdulillah, as you always say, like we're, we're telling our own story. We're presenting our own narrative, mm -hmm. right? Like our, our youth are coming from homes that are like uh, irrespective of the level of religiosity of different homes, but mm -hmm. there's kind of like a baseline of, um, religious values and practices that are inherited um, in a cultural way, mm -hmm. which, I mean, that's not necessarily a good thing, but the, the point being that the kids in our community, they're coming from homes with relatively um, similar backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, like they're going into the schooling system and it's just such a stark contrast from what they're exposed to at home. And I would add on to that, that the the timing is also very sensitive because especially like as they start getting to, you know, upper elementary, middle school, high mm -hmm. school, they're now shifting into a developmental stage, you know, psychologically and emotionally. They're shifting into a stage where their focus is no longer primarily on their parents and their immediate family they're getting into that stage where they're like the social aspect of their being is starting to manifest. It's starting to be nurtured and trained and exercised more. So you're sending them into an environment that is completely at odds with the values that, you know, you might be trying to instill at home. Mm -hmm. And you're doing it at a time where your child is more in need than ever to receive validation from peers, um, of his or her age, mm -hmm. you know, cause like a, a very young child or a baby for them, like the parents are essentially like God for them. Mm -hmm. Like everything they see in the world, mm -hmm. they see it through their parents and their parents are the source of everything. And that's all that they need. Mm -hmm. Um, when they pass that stage, they start to shift outwards. They start to look outwards. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the, the danger of it. Um, yeah. But in terms of, you know, what exactly, are the schools teaching again like if we're talking about it from the idea of um like the religious perspective like what is the danger of sending your child to a school where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been completely um wiped out of the picture and you have this atheistic worldview right that's that's right. what the problem is and also being being taught in a very subtle way so mm -hmm. it's not really detected and that's why the point yeah, in a way of science this is right. under the guise of science right, right. progressiveness mm -hmm. you know this is where we all can agree to disagree mm -hmm. that's like you know something we all share in common mm -hmm. um but it's not mm -hmm. which yeah i mean even that like the idea of um this kind of like false dichotomy that is constantly presented like oh this is religion this is science because th this is another thing that children are being indoctrinated with mm, right. in a very um, subtle way is this, this again, this false dichotomy, this idea that, oh, well, here's God and here's religion and here's science, mm. right? And then there's, there's this kind of idea that um, some people try to rectify this by saying, well, they answer different questions, right? Mm -hmm. Like religion gives you one part of your life and science gives you another part of your life. Mm. The problem with that though, is when you have, for example, like in Islam, even if you look at the Quran, it's not a science textbook, mm -hmm. but the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us about many of the realities of even the physical world and the mm -hmm. natural world, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And even that, there's this kind of conflation that people make between science and the natural world, mm -hmm. right? Like what is in the natural world actually exists in reality. Mm -hmm. Science is a process that is used to discover things about the natural world. Mm -hmm. And it's a process that is conducted by human beings. It's an inductive process, right? And so these are two things that both make it have a level of inherent, um, you know, fallibility within it. And it's also self-correcting. Mm -hmm. So, but the, the most dangerous thing is that when it, it's presented this way in school, like you have religion, like keep it at home, you know, don't talk about it. We're not supposed to talk about that here. 
and then you present science and all the questions that like religion is supposed to answer, they're being answered, right? So like, what does religion tell you? Religion tells you, you know, where did you come from? What is your origin, mm -hmm. right? Previously, like traditionally, yeah, the understanding is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God created us. We come from God. Mm -hmm. Now they took God out of the picture and they sub or they replaced that with an alternative narrative that, well, first there was the Big Bang and then, you know, that led to the formation of the planets and mm -hmm. then you had the earth and then water came and then evolution and so on and so forth. So that fundamental question that all human beings must ask themselves, where did I come from? Mm. It has been answered. Yeah. So there's no need for the religious uh, perspective, mm. right? Mm. And then like, if you keep going, you'll get that more and more, right? Like, how do you know, um, like, how should we live our lives or whatever? All of these questions have been answered mm. without recourse to God. So at the end of the day, what like what these students are getting is that if they have any sort of religion, mm -hmm. it's like a hollow shell of religion. It's a very superficial, nominal identity. Mm -hmm. And this is how you get, and, and this is like, realistically, like this is how we grew up. Like we saw that, okay, in our, in our high school, for example, this person's a Muslim and this person can be a Christian and this person can say they don't believe in any God. But if you were to look at them mm -hmm. in terms of beliefs and lifestyle, they all would listen to the same music. They all would watch the same movies. Mm -hmm. They all would um, attend the same uh, celebrations and functions and gatherings. If you were to ask them, you know, what is your definition of success, for example, they would mm -hmm. all give you a very economic, um, materialistic answer, mm -hmm. right? If you were to ask them, like, what's the purpose of life? They would probably all tell you, you know, like, be happy and do, do what, uh, you know, whatever makes you feel good and pursue your dreams. And like, very kind of like, shallow egocentric interpretations of you know what is the purpose of life so but then why, if you ask them all it? they would all say like oh well i'm a muslim i believe in god so like it's like an afterthought so right. either you don't need god at all is the message that you get or if you if you believe in him that's fine he's like you know it doesn't have any real bearing on your life mm -hmm. so why why is it that you know this is being imposed why are why is this agenda being you know, imposed on the children. What is the bigger picture here? What is the purpose of colonizing the mind? So, I mean, there, there's kind of like a, a historical perspective to it um, that kind of, I think it would be beneficial if people were to kind of go back and, and look into, mm -hmm. even when we mentioned like this false dichotomy saying like, oh, like religion and science are two totally different things. Like, where did that even come from? Mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of this goes back to like Europe and the time of the um, the rule or the authority of the church mm -hmm. and the way that the um, church's governmental authority was so uh, repressive and, and it was enforcing a lot of unnatural beliefs and practices. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, this is human nature. Like if somebody pushes you so far this way, mm -hmm. right? Your, your reaction when you recognize like this is extreme mm -hmm. is often to bounce back to the other extreme. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, like if anybody pays attention, you would notice this even in your own personal life, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you see somebody doing something and you think it's too much one way, All right. we often make the mistake of trying to balance, it's like teeter-tottering, right? Um, mm -hmm. We make the mistake of balancing by going to the other extreme. Mm -hmm. And then with time, we start to realize like, okay, we went to extreme, now let's All come right. back to the middle. All right. And so like the, the history of, of that with the church, like that's where a lot of these um, secular ideas began to be born. People started hating religion. Exactly. And, and unfortunately, again, that's, that's kind of like the weakness of um, human logic mm -hmm. at times because we, do, we don't apply that logic to anything else in life. Like if you, I mean, even right now, like the, the Pfizer, what was he like CEO or, yeah. or something? He had some high position in Pfizer and he admitted openly that like, you know, they had put out the vaccine and they said that it would help prevent the transmission of COVID. And mm -hmm. that's what they say, like vaccinate to save yourself and others and, and whatever. And he, he admitted that they put it out, they put out the vaccine and they made that claim without even testing whether or not it prevents transmission. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a, that's a blatant um, example of a misuse of authority and a betrayal of the trust of the people by an expert. But mm. in what field? In the field of, in, in, a, in a subset of the sciences. Mm. You don't see people come and say now like, 
like science like what do we want with science this stuff is so backwards and blah 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 like no they they chalk it off to like okay like this is a one-off instance of somebody right, who's being right. dishonest right. and it's like that with everything like if mm-hmm. your doctor does something wrong or if you hear a case of like medical fraud you don't say i'm not going to visit any more doctors or take any more medicine right, right. but why don't we apply that same logic yeah if you saw a scholar who either was ignorant mm-hmm. or um or even co-opted right like mm-hmm. some some people look like religious scholars and they promote like mm-hmm. the opposite of what religion teaches mm-hmm. like why not look and go back to the source and actually study like is that what's really being taught mm-hmm. and i think the the su- the subtle things that you mentioned are are more dangerous than the more prominent things Absolutely. right like if you if you so your teacher, like I grew up post 9-11, mm-hmm. we had teachers who would make mm-hmm. racist comments and we would know right away, oh, that's, you know, going against my religion. Mm-hmm. There's a case now in Australia where, where children are being shown blasphemous images mm-hmm. of the Holy Prophet, mm-hmm. Alaihi mm-hmm. Wasallam. Um, and, and the kids know right away that, look, we got to tell mom because mm-hmm. something wrong happened. Mm-hmm. But these things, mm-hmm. you know, the parents themselves, uh, you know, you know, we, we try our best. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, parents are sending their children to learn how to read, write, mm-hmm. you know, eventually go on to college, get right. a degree. Um, Although so, there's a lot to be even said about right, that. So, <laughs> so I think that's the main argument is that is that all life should be about? Like, is that what success looks like? Well, you know. I think I think it's even deeper than that. Like to the the idea, and this is something that has been brought up, like within the community and at the board, school board meetings and stuff like that. Of like, you know, we're sending our kids to learn reading and writing and math and science, and yeah, like obviously that's true. That's why parents are sending their kids to school. Mm-hmm. But um, and maybe people are saying this as just like an argumentative point like right. to get their point across. But realistically, like again, if you go into the like kind of scratch beneath the surface and mm-hmm. see like. That that's not what the schooling system was established for. But like, I mean, we can get into that. But just like one more point about the previous thing, like, why is this godlessness being imposed on Mm -hmm. society? Um, So I said there's that historical perspective, but that that's not necessarily an agenda. That's just a natural kind of chain of events, Mm -hmm. and like one thing leads to the other. Mm -hmm. But in terms of an agenda. it's it's very clear again if you understand god and religion as it is meant to be as they are meant to be understood mm-hmm. right the the bottom line like if we start with the conclusion mm-hmm. is that a godless people who are drowning in their own um materialistic mm-hmm. and lustful desires and te- and temptations are much easier to control Right. And this is something that's like, this is a trend of history. Mm. This is not like some kind of new theory, even the Quran, like mm. over a thousand years ago. Right. And it's relating something that happened thousands of years before that. Right. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about Fir'aun, mm. the Pharaoh, you know, who kind of um, was dominating Egypt. Allah describes him, he says, فَاسْتَخَفَّ قَوْمَهُ فَأَطَاعُوا Right. Pharaoh basically, um, stupefied that's a rough translation but he stupefied his people mm. right he brainwashed them فأطاعوا, so they obeyed him mm. right and this is the fundamental problem and that's why you see that there's no there's no issue with religion mm. in this secular society so long as your religion doesn't have any bearing on or any influence on the interests of those who are who are in charge mm. right but when you say that um like, for example, from a Muslim perspective, when you say la ilaha illallah, mm. it's translated like there's no God except for Allah. Right. And you could say, okay, that's a fair translation. But the question is, what does God even mean? If you ask the majority of people, and and I've done this like with a lot of mm. students and you know youth that I've interacted with through programs, mm. like when you say, what does it mean? Who is God? What is God? Mm. The the answer that you're like almost invariably gonna get is that God is the creator. Mm. they're synonyms right like in Mm. people's minds they're synonyms Mm. god is the one who created Mm. it doesn't go beyond that that, right right. but if you take it further right and especially from an islamic perspective from an islamic world view tawheed or the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is much deeper than that 
Yeah. Right? When we say that there's no la ilaha illallah, there's no God except for Allah, it doesn't only mean that there's no creator. Mm. It also means that there's no legislator. And this is common sense. Like mm. if I create something, mm. I own it. If mm. I own it, I make the rules for it. Mm. Right? So, but imagine what would happen mm. to the powers that, that exist, right? Especially the imperialistic powers. What would happen to their influence if all of these you know, Muslims, for example, woke up and recognized that we will not submit to any authority except for the authority of God. And then that would spread and other people would recognize. I mean, this is like enshrined in, in many Islamic slogans, right? Like and when I you say, La narka illa lillah, we won't bow except to Allah. And, that's and a I threat. Think, I think that's why I feel like there is a direct hatred towards Islam as a religion. Absolutely. Because Islam today is, is a social, political religion. It's the know? only one left. It's because one again, left. like exactly. Christianity through the enlightenment and through their history has been secularized. So from, from the hijab, like what we see now, you know, the attacks on Islamophobia, mm-hmm. religion, mosques being vandalized. Mm-hmm. There is a a, a synchronized um, like There's a, a hatred, comprehensive agenda hatred yeah. agenda around the mm-hmm. world. Um, so I find that interesting. But you know, what is the solution? What's the way forward then? Like if so, from from my perspective, I feel like there is a clash of civilizations mm-hmm. going on, right? Where I feel like everything that the school systems today stand for are incomplete opposition Mm -hmm. with the values of islam Mm -hmm. now some parents will be like you know the children need to be exposed to the real world they need to deal with the realities you know at an early age because you know tough that's what that's what's gonna happen out there it's also an inconsistent logic like i mean again like why don't we the logic that we apply or the rationale that we apply when it comes to religion and spirituality we don't apply it to anything else. Mm-hmm. Like you're you're taking like young, impressionable hearts and minds, and you're saying that you're gonna throw them into like a cesspool of every spiritual and moral and you know ideological corruption that you can think of mm-hmm. and say that, oh well, you know, they have to see the real world. Like, you know, we don't take babies and expose them to all kinds of viruses and and bacteria and things like that in, in like one instant. Mm-hmm. And say, well, well, these bacteria and viruses, they they exist in the world, so they have to get used to it. Like, no, there's a program of like c- a controlled exposure, right? Like, or limited exposure. Like, that's something. Same thing, like screen time. Even even the parents who say this, like, what are we protesting right now, right? Mm. Like, does the LGBT um, agenda not I feel exist? Like, it's in the all world? come to a boil now. Yeah. Like, it's now. It's it's. And, yeah. But, you know, sometimes th- these things need to happen in order for people to, you know, kind of start asking questions. Yeah. Right? That's, um, I mean, that's the catalyst. But yeah, I mean, like, again, and again, like with the with the schooling and stuff like that, like it, it would be it would be a little bit naive if we were to just kind of like really believe this narrative that, you know, the schools were just set up to teach us reading and writing and, and math and whatever, mm. you know, and, and this goes, you know, if people would again look into like the history of like the colonization of Africa, the colonization of um, the Muslim lands in the so-called Middle East, mm. even the colonization of these lands right here, like in the United States, mm. right? One of the consistent tactics that has always been employed by the colonizing forces mm. has always been the establishment of colonial schools, mm. right? Whether it was like missionaries, like to promote um, the colonizers' version of Christianity, mm-hmm. or just like um, not necessarily Christian schools, but just schools established and and or sanctioned mm-hmm. by the colonizing forces, mm-hmm. right? And and this is kind of like this is a fact of history. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's mentioned like one of the things that the colonizers would do is that they would when they would enter a land, right, they would outlaw um, traditional methods of teaching and they would shut down schools. They would even sometimes imprison teachers. Right. And then they wouldn't let you teach unless you're teaching what they approve of. Mm. Right. And this is again, this is what was done in Africa. This is what was done in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a a very interesting quote. By. um, He's referred to as Lord Cromer, but he's the uh, he kind of when Britain colonized Egypt, Mm. um, he was kind of like the the ruling uh, governor or authority of Britain mm-hmm. over Egypt. 
And he has a book called Modern Egypt. And he really like, he goes into like the explicits of his, of his experience, right? And he says that, um, this is a quote from his book. He says, the truth is that in passing through the European educational mill, the young Egyptian Muslim loses his Islamism. Mm. And then it goes on and then, um, Be it says, yeah. And he, and he says, therefore to the disqualifications of his competitors, the Europeanized Egyptian naturally becomes, if not the only possible at all events, the principal agent for administering the country, mm. except insofar as it is administered by Europeans. Mm. So he's, he's, he colonized the country and he's literally saying this is what I our think. schools are designed to mm. Europeanize uh, or de-Islamify the mm. Muslims mm. so that wherever we are not directly in charge, mm. then our Europeanized um, puppets will be in charge. So even though it'll be an Egyptian um, leading the country, mm. it's actually a European leading the country, right? And this is the exact same thing that was done to the Native Americans, again, like you know, it's it's out there, like anybody can look it up, the testimonies of Native Americans and British colonists. And um, and then after the American Revolution, the um, American government officials, the testimonies are all there of them saying very clearly that, um, I mean, this was even done, mm. you know, with westward expansion, right? When the American government was moving west mm -hmm. and they were kind of pushing the Native Americans further and further west mm. and then encroaching more and more upon their lands. And then they would make these peace treaties. Mm. At some point, they started including like these provisions within the peace treaties that they would say that one of the conditions of the peace is that the Native Americans would send their children to the um, American schools, mm. right? So they're doing this to basically do the same exact thing that Britain did in Egypt, which is mm. take these natives, right, educate them in such a way that they become Americanized mm. that way they will do our bidding for us. Mm -hmm. right? If you take that same logic now and then you apply it to the public schools, it's the exact same scenario. The only difference is instead of a foreign entity like Britain going in and colonizing natives like Britain on Egypt or like America on the Native Americans, now it's a government that is doing the same thing to its own citizens, mm -hmm. right? Because you're talking about a government that is... Um, taking advantage of and exploiting all of its own citizens. I mean, like the some of the biggest people who um, lose from American imperialism mm -hmm. are the American citizens. Like right. it's their money that's being stolen from them and mm -hmm. being wasted and squandered on senseless things. Mm -hmm. It's their money that's being used to line the pockets of, you know, corporate billionaires. Mm -hmm. So how, what are you going to do with these people that if they were to wake up, wake up mm. right, they, it would, everything. yeah, it would be a revolution. Mm. So what do you do? You take them and you put them through this educational system that indoctrinates them into these kind of, um, blind corporate uh, cogs. Yeah. Like, and, and I mean, that's another part. So there's the political aspect of the education but that, but system. That's, see, Tarek, that's the thing though, right? Like, let's go back to that definition of success, right? Mm. A lot of the parents, Muslim parents specifically, are immigrants, mm -hmm. right? Who've worked hard their whole lives. They right. they move here for the American dream. Mm -hmm. The American dreams to send your child to school. Mm -hmm. They get this good, comfortable job. They get, you know, into the best colleges if possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and they they settle down with the family and live a good life, mm -hmm. a comfortable life. Mm -hmm. And that is the ideal success. That's something that the parents didn't couldn't afford for themselves um so like what is the solution then like if this is at odds with an institution that is set up to colonize mm -hmm. your child's mind mm -hmm. it's obviously going to break down the identity mm -hmm. eventually the family with mm -hmm. these unnatural you know agendas mm -hmm. and it's going to break down the muslim identity mm -hmm. um and that's what we're seeing and and so what is the solution you know, going forward with with cultivating a strong Muslim identity, if that becomes that priority for the parent. So um, there's a quote that's uh, attributed to Malcolm X, Shaheed Malcolm X, rahmatullahi, where he says, "Only a fool would let his enemy educate his children." Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it's common sense. The, I think the problem is again, like we, so many of us. Um, 
either again like maybe because they're immigrant parents and they're coming to this country and like to their kind of um i don't know if i could say to their credit but at least in defense of them mm -hmm. like they had really um you know imminent needs and and um things that they had to take care of like mm -hmm. just establishing a new life all over right like when you're when you're preoccupied with your most basic needs you mm -hmm. don't have the ability to think beyond that right. which by the way is you know what the um political and economic system of this country is also designed designed to do is like mm -hmm. keep people living paycheck, paycheck to, paycheck, to paycheck, paycheck on the hamster mm -hmm. wheel like a cog in like the capitalist machine mm -hmm. so that you're so busy like procuring a living mm -hmm. and providing for your family that you don't have the ability or the time to think beyond that i right? mean but, I, the, from the stats i just uh, looked up mm -hmm. you know over half of the country lives as dual income yeah 53.3 percent mm -hmm. to 40 or 63 percent yep. are two parent households um you know yep. get well that's with a lot of factors right with which, women which being why, in the workforce there but you go. But there's also, you know, the, you know, it's, it's just not cutting which it is for why, a lot of parents. Which is why motherhood is a threat as well. Mm -hmm. Because if, if women were to prioritize as their primary responsibility, mm -hmm. the raising of their own children. Which goes back to Islamic values. Right, uh, right. Which, so if they were to do that, then they wouldn't be working, you know, 40 hour shifts, 40 hour a week uh, mm -hmm. jobs. And then like, if they're doing that, then they have no choice but to outsource the upbringing of their children to some either state institution like schools or to some like kind of business or corporate institution like, you know, daycares and things like that. I right? think it comes down to the idea of freedom, right? Freedom is such a plastic word. You know, I, I just heard a, a, a nice lecture where freedom was described as like the people today want freedom from actually freedom. Mm -hmm. They don't want the consequences that come with true freedom. Um, freedom for secularists will be much different than what right. freedom for, for a Muslim means. It's a vacuous term. It's but an it, empty it's, term. it's getting to be, you know, indifferent. Like when it comes to a lot of people today, they're, they're going to look at freedom as being out there, accomplishing, you know, earning. Freedom in Islam looks much different. Mm -hmm than you know what what they have you believe so yeah, as does justice, everything's breaking right? like, down yeah. in that sense <clears throat> um, yeah so like so what's the solution i i think um again like back to back to what malcolm x said like only a fool would let his enemy educate his children mm -hmm. right there's another there's another very interesting quote that kind of just to wrap that up um so her name is um, Asada Shakur. Some people might be familiar with her, right? right? She was a member of like the Black Panthers. Then she joined like the Black Liberation um, Army. Mm -hmm. But she says, the schools we go to are reflections of the society that created them, mm -hmm. right? Which is what we're saying, right? Like the imperialist core mm -hmm. establishes these schools in order, and the colonizers did the same, right? In order to serve their agendas. But then this is the kind of like the kicker of her quote. She says, nobody is going to give you the education you need to overthrow them. Mm. Right, and this is like again, it's common sense. Like if you're right. if you're the elites in charge and you're running the show and you're you're dominating all of the wealth, mm -hmm. you're not going to teach people what they need to know in order to wake up and mm -hmm. you know get what what is rightfully theirs. Mm -hmm. So, like with that being said, I think that it's it's really a pressing need for Muslims to wake up and recognize, you know, as Malcolm said, like we're fools if we're going to hand off our most um, precious yeah most precious, as, valuable you know as i say most most vulnerable and most valuable mm -hmm. right like our children we're going to give them to this system that if we understand the history of it mm -hmm. and if we understand the politics and the economics uh behind it mm -hmm. it's very clear that like they don't have our children's best interest mm -hmm. in mind Right. So we have to do for ourselves what we have been outsourcing to our enemy mm -hmm. for generations and generations. Right. And that could mean either establishing Islamic schools. It could be co homeschooling. It could mm -hmm. be co homeschooling. Um, and I understand, obviously, like this is a general rule. Maybe some people are really those um, extreme uh, but circumstances you, where they say, can't do Tariq, that. Let's, let's be fair here. Like, wouldn't you say 
these options, like let's say the majority of the public in mm -hmm. America is inundated with, mm -hmm. you know, two household incomes. Mm -hmm. You both parents are working. School is that alternative. Then Islamic school or private education becomes that point of privilege. Mm -hmm. um, or, or you have homeschooling where, you know, a woman who ha does it all, right? In, in today's society, in the United States, we don't have, you know, help or maids mm -hmm. and things like that to or, help or with the house or a community where women are, sh are collectively sharing. That and, and many women will say, you know, like teachers like yourself go to be trained and how to teach and, you know, they do their job. Well, women who have to do it all from cooking to cleaning and mm -hmm. household duties mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to keep up with the physical yeah. demands of, yeah. you know, going into trying to figure out how to teach their child. Absolutely. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that it's, I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. So right? what's and the even, solution? And even, even just the point, like to say that the, like sending our children. So first of all, there was the point about like the majority of Americans, like are not going to be able to do that. Um, just to kind of like, you know, center the discussion. I'm not providing a solution right. for the majority of Americans. I'm saying that for us as Muslims, for the majority of Americans, I mean, like, That's I, I do think that, like, they also, like, and we are part of that as well, but mm -hmm. we're also speaking primarily on to the, Muslims. yeah, to, yeah. to our, to our primary and essential identity, which is Islam and mm -hmm. which is, you know, Tawheed. Mm -hmm. But, um, so that's a whole nother discussion, but in terms of Muslims sending, if we speak within that category and say that, well, some families within the Muslim community cannot send their kids to private schools. And so this is a privilege. I would even reframe that and I would say that it's not a privilege in so much as uh, or it's not a privilege as much as it is a responsibility and that's a responsibility that even comes with some burdens right like yeah it's going to be more expensive mm -hmm. right it's going to be um you know there are a lot of other you know struggles right. that might come with it right and and I think that's the main objection that people typically present is like well these schools are so expensive and why are these islamic schools so expensive right but I mean, again, we need to think a little bit, right? Mm. Running a school costs a lot of money. Mm. That's why they're taking our tax dollars to fund these schools, although they're mm. doing a poor job of it because they're spending over a trillion dollars on the military and right. you know, not much of that on the education, mm -hmm. which also shows that they don't really care about their own citizens. Yeah. But um, it costs money to run a school. Mm -hmm. The whole premise of the discussion is that the schools that are run by the state and are funded by the state mm -hmm. are indoctrinating our children to serve the interest of the state. Mm -hmm. So like logically, the only solution is that if you want to educate your own children, you cannot outsource it. You have to do it yourself. And that costs money, mm -hmm. right? How are you going to make up that money if you don't have the money coming in from the state? The, realistically, as of right now, the only solution that we have is to charge tuition. Mm -hmm. Although I think that, you know, one of the most important things that we need to come together and discuss as a Muslim community is why are we not able, for example, with all the money that we have in this community, oh. why are we not able to set up a collective fund, mm. right? That could be um, administered by representatives of different schools, mm. different Islamic private schools, mm. right? That could subsidize the tuition of families that recognize the dangers that their kids are facing, of families that prioritize the Islamic and spiritual upbringing of their children, mm -hmm. such that if tuition is, for example, $5,000, this family can afford 2000 Okay, we have a fund that's ready to cover the, the remaining 3000 mm -hmm. That's one point, and that's, that's a so collective I, I guess responsibility. For, for that to happen, the priority needs to be given to this Absolutely, and, and, and I mean, you would, obviously, like, we would assume that if we're having this discussion, we're having yeah. it with people who recognize are, a lot of the preliminaries some, of this discussion. some fathers who really prioritize education will work two, three jobs. Absolutely. The mother will stay Absolutely. home. And, and, and that, that was, happen. that was my next point. Um, just as a response to people who, you know, complain a lot. And I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not going against genuine complaints of people who sincerely are worried. Like, what am I going to do? I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about people who can afford it or would be able to afford it. And they're just like complaining in a very passive and a pessimistic way. Another point is like prioritizing our finances, right? If we look at the early history of Islam, like when, when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi when he made Hijrah from Mecca to Medina, mm -hmm. 
the Muslims left Mecca, they left behind their homes, they left behind their families sometimes, jobs, wealth. They took with them to a new city what they could carry with them, mm. right? And when they got there, no homes, no jobs, like hardly any property or possessions or wealth, the Muslims who were living in Medina, the Ansar, right, they had the responsibility of taking in those Muslims. Like, look at how much was sacrificed mm. and look at how much was endured on a social and economic level in order to preserve the faith, the faith and the mm. spirituality of the community. So, like, my, my point is that you see some people like, is it really so radical and so drastic, for example, to say, you know, sell your home and buy a smaller house? buy a less expensive house, cut back on vacations, cut back on certain things. Like if somebody does all of that and then they still can't afford, that's where you subsidize. But mm. I mean, we have to get our priorities in order. That's mm. one thing. And the, and the subsidizing is beyond just like tuition, right? Even for example, like what incentive do the most talented and brightest and passionate of our youth within, mm. the, Mus within the Muslim community what incentive do they have to go into teaching, mm. let alone teaching in, a, in an Islamic private school, right? Mm. Where the criteria are, you know, even more strict, right? Like, I mean, you, it, you have to be very careful about yeah. who you put in a classroom in any school. But now when you're talking about an Islamic school, it's even more serious. Mm. How do we incentivize getting our brightest and most passionate youth into to take that route, right? Like mm -hmm. this is something, the money, this is something I repeat like over and over and over again when I have discussions with people. The Like in this community, the money is there, but the vision is not. Mm -hmm. And that's why like the, the primary step is like a um, think tank. An effort of like- A think like, tank for- yeah, It's like tell like, our, like and... raising awareness. Mm -hmm. Cause you can't solve a problem if you don't even acknowledge that it exists. If you haven't exists, diagnosed right. it, right. you can't cure it. You can't solve it. Well, thank you so much, Tariq, for shedding light to this important issue. I think this is uh, super important with everything going on um, here in Dearborn and in other you mm -hmm. know, states as mm -hmm. well, where parents are recognizing that there are the red lines, right? The mm -hmm. red lines that are, are, are being crossed um, that are, are completely against their religious beliefs mm -hmm. and morals. Thank you all for joining us today on the fourth episode of Forgotten Country where we talk about important world issues through a God-centric lens. And I'll see you next time.